so 1 Samuel chapter 10, it starts out there with uh, Saul finally anointing uh, Samuel to be the king of Israel and to send him out. And if you remember in the previous chapter, you know, Saul, Saul's kind of had his doubts, I think, up to this point. You know, he's telling him, hey, who, you know, uh, who, who are all the eyes of Israel upon but, but thee? You know, and who, you know, he was that he was the desire of Israel at that point. And if you recall, uh, you know, Samuel, he kind of, he was doubting. He said, you know, who am I? You know, who is my, who is my family? We're the least of all the tribes of Israel. So I think at this point, you know, Saul is kind of still doubting maybe a little bit about what's about to take place. He, he, and we even see that kind of towards the end of the chapter. He might explain some of his reluctance too. And I think that's why Samuel here, not only does he anoint him, but then he kind of dispels these doubts by get telling him exactly what's going to take place uh, throughout the day. You know, the, the details are here for a reason, you know, and there's some things that we can kind of uh, look at and learn from uh, tonight that, and, and I can make application with. And, you know, let me just say right out of the gate, you know, one of the great things about the Bible and preaching it is that somebody, you know, there, there's so many different ways. Obviously, there's always a primary interpretation. There's always the surface meaning of, of the scripture. But the Bible just lends itself to so many different situations in our lives and things like that and just lends, a, uh, lends itself to being applied as a preacher sees fit. So I'm going to do that a little bit later on tonight, you know, and I'm just going to try to make application when we get into the story. But starting right out of the gate, what we see is that, you know, Saul is, has some doubts and Samuel kind of gives him, tells him what's going to happen here in order that he might kind of dispel those doubts. And I think that's what, that was the point of it. And it had its effect. You look there in verse 9, it says, And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And what I think that's saying there is that, you know, that, that change of his heart is that God began to work on his heart, maybe gave him a change of mind, you know. Kind of changed his attitude, I believe. Not, you know, physically or spiritually made him, you know, uh, gave him a different heart. But it's actually talking about his countenance, his thinking, the way he was perceiving things. I believe that's what that's referring to. And he goes away and he's turning away and he, then all these signs begin to take place. And, you know, I just want to touch on this real quick tonight is the fact that, you know, some people mistakenly teach that all sign seeking is sinful. Now, don't get me wrong. Some seeking of signs is sinful, but you can see examples in the scripture of seeking signs that are bad. And you can see seek, seek, uh, examples in the scriptures of seeking signs that are good. And we'll look at one of the bad ones, of course. First, let's go to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. Not all sign seeking is sinful. Okay, now wicked people do seek for a sign, but they're not necessarily seeking for the sign. It's not what makes them wicked. Okay, it's just that wicked people do that. But good people also do that too. And we'll see that as well in a minute. But the Bible says, you're going to John 10. It says in Matthew chapter 12 in verse 38, then certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So they're coming to Jesus. They have their doubts and they're saying, hey, prove yourself. We would see a sign from thee. Now remember, what was the context there of that situation? They wanted Jesus to prove who he was. That's, you know, this is like the person who says, you know, I'd believe God, you know, if God would just show up here, you know, and, and would manifest in front of me, then yeah, I'd believe him. The problem with that is that doesn't require any faith. And he that, you know, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You know, without faith, it is impossible to please him. You know, to, to sit there and say, self, prove God, I can't do that. And Jesus wasn't going to do that either. Although Jesus did many things in their time, in their day, to prove that he was God. They're, you know, he even said, well, I'm getting ahead of myself anyway. You know, but he said, you know, if you believe not my words, believe me for my work's sake. But he said there, they're, they're saying here, they're tempting him and saying, hey, we would see a sign from thee. Prove who you are. Give us a sign, right? But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Of course, that's referring to his death, burial, and resurrection. But notice he's saying there that it was an evil and adulterous generation that seeketh after a sign. Now, was them seeking a sign what made them evil and adulterous? No, it's the fact that they were, you know, had, had gone away from the God, Lord God of Israel. They went a whoring after other gods. They weren't serving God in truth. They were already evil. They were already adulterous, and they were seeking a sign. So they're not wicked for seeking a sign, but because they are wicked, you know, they're not going to believe on Christ. They're going to reject Christ and they're going to require a sign. You're there in John 10. You know, this is another instance here. He says uh, in verse 22, and it was at Jerusalem and the feast of the dedication and it was winter and Jesus walked in the temple of, in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, how long dost thou make us to doubt? Now, is he making them to doubt? 
You know, they're kind of pinning on him, saying, why don't you just prove yourself? Why don't you just, you know, come out and just prove to us that you're Christ? Even when he's on the cross, you know, if thou be, if he, if he, you know, he said he could save others, you know, save himself. You know, if thou be the Christ, come down from the cross and we will believe. Now, he's not the one that's making the doubt. That they're, like, they're trying to put that on him because they're seeking for a sign because they are wicked and because they are adulterous. He says, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. And that's kind of the irony is that even if God, you know, these people that say, hey, if, you know, if God was real and if he would just show up, I'd believe on him. I highly doubt that. Even if, some, if God did do some, you know, did some miracle in their life, they'd still doubt it because they don't want to believe. And then even in, the, in many instances, they can't believe because they're reprobates. But I've seen this even in my own personal life, you know, where, and this is why I don't think we should rely so heavily on these, you know, these, these, these proofs of the Bible and things like that. Those things are great, you know, and they're, they're interesting to look at and, and study about and, and learn about. And for example, one would be, you know, the proofs of the Red Sea crossing. Who's ever seen that video where, you know, there's, it's in the Gulf of Aqaba that would have, you know, would have been the Red Sea in their, in their day. It's, it's, it's a, you know, a, an inlet off the Red Sea. And the, the land formation's just perfect. There's nowhere else along the Red Sea that they could cross because it was just so jagged and steep. But like in the Gulf of Aqaba, there's just this perfect land mass that just comes up. It's a plateau. It's soft. It's full of sand. And then on top of that, you know, there, it's full of all these very strange coral formations. And coral has to attach to something in order to, to grow on it. And they have these perfect 90 degree angles. They even see, they show you these chariot wheels. Now, I've never been there and never seen it, but, you know, they say they saw it, and, and you know, I believe it. I mean, the Bible says it happened. And then they go across to the other side. There's, the, there's a mountain that's burned with fire, just like they, they had when they went over there. There's the, 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 the stone altar that the Aaron made the golden calves and, and caused them to worship. All that stuff's over there. Even the Saudi, you know, the Saudi Arabian government acknowledges it for what it is. All the locals there say, hey, this is the Mount of Moses. You know, I remember showing that video to somebody in my family and hoping that this would bring them around, you know what? They still didn't believe it. That's right. sure. because, because that's not what's going to get people saved. Yeah, right. Videos and archaeology and, and creation science, that's not going to get people saved. Now look, right. it might work on some people to bring them around, maybe pull them out of you know, their brainwashing or help them expose them to the lies, but you know, the, the preaching of the cross is the power of the gospel. Yeah. Right. So even he said here, look, I, <laughs> I have told you and you believe not. And he said, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Look, they had all the proof they needed to believe. So why are they seeking after a sign? Because they're wicked. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody that, that looks for a sign from God is wicked. It just means that, you know, these guys are wicked. Look down at verse 31. He said, Then the, stu the, the Jews took up stones to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And look at verse 37. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe me not, believe the works. They're saying, prove your Christ, prove your Christ. Okay, let me feed 5,000 people with a few loaves. Let me walk on the water. Let me bring people back from the dead on multiple occasions. No, no, tell us plainly. Tell us plainly. Well, believe my works. What they really wanted him to do is just come out and say, I'm God. So then they could have right, so that they could accuse him. <coughs> But what did he say in Luke 16? He said, look, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will be, per be persuaded the one rose from the dead. Even when he came back from the dead and showed himself alive unto his apostles, that even wasn't enough of a sign. And that was the sign he promised to give them. Right? He said, look, there shall no sign be given except for the sign of the prophet Jonas. And that's what he gave them. So even these people that are, these wicked people that are looking for a sign, even when they get the sign that he's promised them, they still don't believe it. They still reject it. So what we're talking about this at, at the beginning here is just sign seeking. And I want to make it clear that not all sign seeking is bad. You know, I remember early in my Christian life, you know, we were trying to kind of figure out what God's will is and stuff like that. And I remember saying to another Christian something along the lines of like, well, maybe God will show me or he'll give me a sign. And they're like, whoa, an evil and adulterous generation so you get after a sign. Well, like, hey, I'm not a Christ rejecting Jew. Right. You know, I'm not a God hating Pharisee. You know, I'm God's child. You know, and it kind of confused me for a little while. I'm like, well, does that, is this me looking for a sign, like looking for God to lead me? The Bible says that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Right. You know, <laughs> so I'm thinking, God's going to lead me. Trust the Lord with all thine heart, and he shall direct thy paths. So how, is, how am I supposed to, to, to know what God's will is? Will he show me what his will is? 
Will he, will he engineer circumstances? Will he, you know, give me a sign ah! along the way to help me know that this is God's will? Now go over to, uh, go over to, uh, where am I going to have you go? Well, just go back to where you were. We'll, we'll get off this real quick. But look, God, yeah, God, you know, he gave signs even to the wicked and adulterous people that asked for it. And they still didn't believe it. You know, but God has given sign to other, uh, signs to other people in Scripture. Think about Gideon, right? You ever hear a, a preacher say that, you know, when you're saying, trying to make a decision in your life? You say, well, maybe you've got to put the fleece out. What they're talking about is you maybe got to get in prayer and, and ask God to show you or say, God, if this be your will, then do this. And if this be your will, then do this. And put it to God and tell him to show you what his will is. And that's exactly what Gideon did. As he put out the fleece and he said, look, if you want me to go and defeat the Midianites, then, you know, let the, let the I don't know which order, which order it was in, but he said, let the dew be on the, on, the, on the fleece only and the grass be dry. And it was so. And that still wasn't enough. Then he did it again. He said, okay, that's good. That's good. I appreciate that, Lord. But let's do it again just one more time, just so I can be sure that this is what you want me to do. He says, this time, though, I want the, the fleece to be dry and I want everything else to be wet. And that's what happened. And I think I got the order backwards, but you get the point. Yeah. And when did he do that? When did Gideon put the fleece out? It was after the angel of the Lord already appeared to him and, and burned his lunch. Remember that part of the story? Where he brings them the, the, the food and he, and he says, take the food, put it on the rock, and he pours out the broth on it and then he it consumes it in a flame. And he says, surely I've been visited by the angel of the Lord. I've, I've seen the face of God. That's, and then even after that, He's still like, well, let me put a fleece out and, it's, and get a sign from God. Does that make, so does that make Gideon an evil and adulterous and wicked person for doing that? No, it's just somebody who wants to know that he's doing God's will. That was after he tore down his dad's idol, you know, to, to Baal in his, in his own garden. Think about Israel and Egypt. How many signs were they given by the hands of Moses? I mean, how many, how many different miracles did God do to, to, to let Pharaoh know, hey, this is the finger of God? God gives signs to people and not just wicked people. <clears throat> just be, you know, what I rather should say is that, you know, just seeking for a sign from God does not make you wicked. It, it's, it, you know, that's a false teaching that I've heard. You know, and I, and I see, what I see here in the scriptures, I see that's what Samuel's doing with Saul. Yeah, I got that right. These two names, I get so confused. I keep saying Saul and Samuel. Yeah, Samuel did that for Saul, right? He said, hey, I know you have your doubts, but I'm going to tell you what's going to happen today. You're going to go along and this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen. Why? So that you'll know that I'm not, you know, just making all this up. That you really are going to be the king of Israel. And of course, some, uh, some amazing things began to happen. And I kind of want to look at these things uh, that happened. These different signs that came to pass. And just kind of make application tonight. Because it kind of ends here, this story, before the, the first half of it kind of ends with, you know, Saul you know, begins to prophesy. You know, he becomes another man. He's filled with the Spirit and he's among the prophets and everyone's kind of scratching their heads. But I want to kind of just look at this tonight and say, what makes a man a prophet? What is a guy going to need to become a preacher? You know, and we could apply this to men that want to preach one day or be pastors or whatever, but you could also apply this to anybody who wants to go out and preach the gospel, right. which is the most important preaching you'll ever do, in my opinion. <coughs> but Saul's given these signs and I believe when we look at these signs, these things that come to pass, you, we can make application about what makes a man a prophet. What took place along the way that it led to Saul becoming a preacher. Now it says there in verse 1, Then Samuel took a, vo a, ve a vial of oil and poured it upon his head and kissed him and said, Is it not because the Lord hath anointed thee to be captain over his inheritance? He's kind of questioning him, right? Saying, this is, this is what's going on here and let me prove it to you. When thou art departed from me today... Then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulchre in the border of Benjamin at Zelza. And they shall say unto the ashes, asses which thou, found, uh, thou wentest to seek are found. So one of the first things I'd point out is that, you know, and this is kind of, ad admittedly, this is a little bit of a stretch, okay, but I'm going with it. He says the asses which, which thou went to seek are found. That which is lost has been found, right? So if you want to be a preacher, you got to be saved, right? You know, that which is lost has to be found. And you say, well, yeah, duh, Brother Corbin, of course that's the case. But how many people, there's a lot of preachers getting up today that are not saved. They don't have the right gospel. They might even think they're saved. Not, of them, not all of them are just full-blown, you know, charlatans, you know, sons of the devil that are just trying to fleece a flock. They're actually guys that actually think they're preaching the right thing, and they're not even saved. 
I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but how about that? There's a good place to start. You want to be a man of God? You want to be a preacher? You want to go out and preach the gospel to somebody else and get them saved? We better make sure we're saved first. And the good news is that being saved is really easy. Amen. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It's that simple. But he goes on here and he says in verse 3, Then thou shalt go forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor, and there shall meet thee three men going up to God to Bethel. So he meets with what? Three men, right? And as I look at this, you know, he says he's going to meet with these men. Now, who else, who else comes in threes? God, right? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. And where are they going? To Bethel, which is the house of God, right? So I, you know, and again, this is just me making application as I see fit. You know, somebody else could preach this and get a whole other message out of it, which is what I love about the Bible. But he says here, look, you're going to meet three men. And, you know, that's like the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, you want to be a, a, a preacher, you got to get with God. <laughs> you know, they're going up to Bethel. You better get in church. You better learn the word of God. You better get in, get with God, meet with the Lord, have a time of prayer. That's something that, that's going to help you what? Be filled with the Spirit. Because the best preaching is Spirit-filled preaching. And, and this is, that's what ends up happening here with Saul. As he gets filled with the Spirit and then he becomes a prophet. Then he begins to prophesy with the prophets. So, you know, he's, he, first he's saved. You know, that which is lost was found. He meets with God. These three men, which, you know, are obviously were not God. But I believe I'm just making application, you know, that this could represent God in a sense. And then we have, of course, verse 4, which is the one I really want to focus in on here for a minute. It says, And they will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread, that which thou shalt receive of their hands. So what's this part here? How would, I'm going to apply this part by saying this. Look, if you want to be a spirit-filled preacher, you've got to have the Bible. You've got to have the right Bible. You've got to have the King James Bible. And you've got to have, uh, you have to have the bread, the Word of God. Because remember, Jesus said he was the bread of life, but he also is called the Word of God. So these things are kind of synonymous. So the Bible often, you know, the bread in the Bible can represent both the Lord Jesus Christ. It can also represent, uh, it can also represent, you know, uh, the Bible. You know, like the manna that came down from heaven. So here he's given two loaves. Now what's interesting about this, and if you would, go over to Leviticus chapter 24. You know, notice they had, they had three loaves, right? They had more than one, they had more than two loaves. They had three kids and they had wine. But all they gave them were two loaves, right? They didn't give them everything. They just gave him enough, right, to, 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 get on, to go on his journey. But I also believe that this represents the Word of God because what do you have in the Word of God? You have how many testaments? Two. two. You have two loaves. You got the Old Testament, you got the New Testament. You need them both. You can't just eat the New Testament and forget the Old. You can't just, you know, focus all on the Old Testament and forget the New. Now, if you're going to put emphasis on one or the other, put the emphasis on the New Testament. Right. The better testament, as the Bible calls it. But you got to have both, you know. They they both will uh, sustain you and nourish you, and they will make a, a, a man a prophet, or will make a person a, a bold preacher for the Lord Jesus Christ, knowing all the whole word of God, not just one loaf, but both loaves. You say, hey, brother Corbin, that's a stretch. You gonna sit there and tell me bread here is representing the Old and New Testament? Well, look at Leviticus twenty four verse one, and maybe this is a bit of a stretch too. But you know what? I I, I think I got something here. You know, somebody pointed this out to me, and I said, that's good. I'm gonna use that, so I'm using it. Okay. Look, it says in Leviticus 24, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring thee pure olive, oil olive beaten for the light to cause the lamps to burn continually. Without the veil of the testimony and the tabernacle of the congregation shall Aaron order it from the evening unto the morning before the Lord continually. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. He shall order the lamps upon the pure candlestick before the Lord continually. And that thou shalt take fine flour and bake twelve cakes thereof Two tenths deal shall be in one cake, and thou shalt set them in two rows, six in a row, upon the pure table before the Lord. So he's talking about the showbread that it was supposed to. They weren't just to bring the showbread and just walk out. God said, "Look, you're going to put, you're going to make twelve loaves, and you're going to set them up in this order." And God could have said, "Hey, make fourteen loaves and make two rows of seven. Right. He could have said, "Make sixteen loaves and make two rows of eight. He could have picked any number of loaves that he wanted. But he specifically said, you're going to make 12 rows and you're going to make two rows of six. Six and six. Six and six makes what? 66, right? How many books do you have in the Bible? Hallelujah. It's a miracle, right? <laughs> I thought that was pretty cool when somebody showed that to me. I'm just bringing it out to show you that, hey, saying that these loaves of bread that were given to Saul, 
represent the word of God is not that much of a stretch right. because I don't believe that's much of a stretch. Right. Did God know how many books were going to be in the Bible? No. Sure he did. Of course he did. So, you know, he could have done this and all of his wisdom just put that little gem in there. As much as I'd love to take credit for it, I thought someone emailed me that. I forget who it was, but <laughs> I stole it. <laughs> so, then let, you know, if you don't get anything else tonight, get that. You know, if you share a good idea with the preacher, there's a good chance he'll take it and preach it because we're, we're always looking for things to preach. So, anyway, it's, as long as it's edifying, that's all that matters. But look, he, he gives them these two loaves. If you want to be a spirit-filled preacher, you've got to have the loaves. You've got to have the Word of God, the old and the new. You've got to have the whole counsel of the Word of God. I mean, that was what Timothy was told to do. He said, preach the Word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. But his, his command, the charge that, that Paul gave him was to preach the Word. Not to just preach his opinions, not to just preach you know, what he felt or preach what was popular, but to preach what the Bible says in season and out of season. Preach the whole counsel of the Word of God. You know, and it's also interesting there in verse 4, if you want to go back to 1 Samuel 10, and in verse 4 it says, And they will salute thee and give thee two loaves of bread. And then he says this, Which thou shalt receive of their hands. You know, and, I, and I'm just going to throw this out there because I feel like it and I want to get it off my chest, is that you know, he went right to the source, right? He went to these, these, these three men, and they gave him, you know, and those three men were represent. I, I'm saying were representative of, of God. And God's the one giving him the loaves, just like God gave us two loaves in the Old Testament. But you know what he didn't need? Is like, is somebody, he didn't need to go to Bible college and have somebody give them the loaves, yeah. right? He didn't have to open up a commentary to, 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 to get the word of God. He didn't, you know, he got it for himself. He received it of their hands. He didn't, you know, he didn't have to go to some Bible college and have somebody else teach this stuff. You know, and, and it's unfortunate today that, you know, so many people just want to discredit, you know, sound biblical preaching because the preacher didn't get a degree somewhere. Because he doesn't have, you know, some commendation of man. He doesn't have some placard on some wall somewhere to prove that he went and spent a bunch of money and passed a bunch of tests. Yeah. You know, I don't see Saul doing that. Saul goes there and he goes, you know, he has these three men and they give him the word of God directly. And, you know, any preacher worth his salt, you know, he's going to be able to get in the Bible himself. He's got the same Holy Spirit, and he needeth not that any man teacheth him, because he has the same anointing that teacheth him of all things. And, and he, doesn't, he doesn't need somebody else to explain it to him. And if you would, go over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Look, if you want to be a spirit-filled preacher, whether it's behind a pulpit, whether it's with your own family, whether it's with a stranger at the door, you got to have these things. You got to be saved, right? That's obvious. You got to have to, you know, spend time with God, meet with God. And you have to have the Word of God. You got to know the Bible. <coughs> it says here in Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. If any man have quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above, all these, and above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be thankful. And look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Look, you need to just go to God and receive it from his hands. If any man lack of understanding, let him ask of God, which giveth in all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a, a, a wave of the sea, driven with the, I'm messing it up. But you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Look, if you just go to God with the Bible in hand and say, Lord, help me to understand this book, yeah. you're going to understand it. Yeah. And that's what it says in 1 John. He says, the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you. You know, you have the sealing, the, the, the sealing of the Spirit. You have that anointing. It abides in you. That's never going to go away. But not everybody has the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And, but he says, and you need not that any man teach you. Look, the anointing, the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, you know, if we'll get serious about the Bible, if we get spirit, serious about meeting with God and, and getting the book open and, and praying and asking God to show us things, he will. You know, he'll, he'll help us to behold marvelous things out of his law. And you don't need somebody else to point all these things out to you. Now, look, you, you, there's, and I, I've heard it said, and I agree with this, and I'll say it myself, is that there's nothing that I as a preacher can teach you that you can't learn on your own. Learn on your own. It just might take longer, right? I mean, I know that's the case with me. There, I learned a lot of things through preaching. Now, if I had just spent you know, hours every day reading and reading, I probably would have figured a lot of those things out. 
But you know what? A lot of us have lives. We have other things going on. We can't do that. We need the preaching of the Word of God to... to it's, it's like a... I don't want to say steroid because that's really <laughs> godly. But it's like a... It's a boost, you know? It's like a supplement. It's, it's, it's there to, to... It's like a... Like some kind of... I'm trying to think of an analogy. Like if you ever played a race car game where you have the nitrous oxide button, you know, you're going to complete that track just fine, but you're only going to be able to go so fast. You know, reading the Bible, praying to God, you know, but if you, if you go to a Bible preaching church... You know, that's like hitting that nitrous oxi uh, oxide button. Which is like, you know, and you're going to take off and you're going to get a boost, right? You're going to get farther ahead quicker than you would otherwise. But look, you have the anointing and you need not that any man teacheth you anything, right? But that, you know, so the question is, are you taking advantage of that? You know, are you getting alone with God? Are you meeting with the Lord? Are you opening up? Are you taking both loaves and eating that on a daily basis? <laughs> are you like it's commanded us there in Colossians 3 and keep something in Colossians 3 if, if you've moved we're going to come back but he says let the word of God or word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom let it you know God wants the word of God to dwell in us God wants it to be on our minds and in our hearts you know that's why I love singing these you know singing these psalms that we've been singing Psalm 67 God be merciful unto us and bless us you know you're singing the word of God you know, we're going to talk about how much that comes into, you know, singing and praise here in a minute. But, you know, who else has just had that on their, on their mind throughout the week? It's, I mean, I just find myself singing it out of nowhere. I'm like, man, that's great. You know, it's just a catchy tune, and, and I have the Word of God. I'm letting it dwell in me richly. That's what God wants for us, you know. And we have the anointing. We have everything we need to be filled with all the wisdom of God. The question is, are we just too busy to do it? Or maybe we just don't care enough. You know, are we taking advantage of that? So to, to what makes a man a prophet? You know, what makes a preacher a preacher? What, whether it's behind the pulpit or elsewhere, is that, you know, you're saved, you meet with God, you have the Word of God, but you also have the Spirit of God. And that's kind of where everything kind of culminates here in, in, uh, in a verse 6. If you look there again, he says uh, in verse 6, well, let's pick it up in verse 5. And after that, thou shalt come to the, gar the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass... When thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet thee, that, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place, with what? With a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them. So we're going to talk about that in a minute. But you notice this, the the the, uh, the the musical aspect here, the use of song and praise, and it says, and they shall prophesy. So you have these guys that are not only musicians, but they're also the prophets. They're the ones that are prophesying. But you can see how much music plays a big part in that. And it says, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee. And that's really the most important thing. You know, that's, that's what this is all leading up to, is getting the Spirit of God to come upon you. And look, there's a lot of crazy ideas out there today about you know, what that means to become filled with the Spirit. And if you're going to be you know, a preacher of any type, you know, whether you're preaching to the lost or preaching behind a pulpit, you have to be filled with the Spirit if you're going to be effective. And, and, you know, I mean, think about what they did in Acts 2. Think about Peter when he preached, you know, on the day of Pentecost and thousands of people get saved. What happened prior to that was the filling of the Holy Spirit. You know, there was the, 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 the mighty rushing wind that filled the house where they were sitting. You know, the, the, the flame sitting upon them, being filled with the Spirit. And the Spirit, it says, gave them utterance. You know, he was the one that opened their mouth and caused them to speak. So we see that, you know, being filled with the Spirit is, is something you have to have if you're going to be a prophet, if you're going to be among the prophets. And people have a lot of strange ideas today about what it means to be filled with the Spirit. You know, you go into a Pentecostal church and they're going to tell you it's, you know, barking like a dog, <laughs> rolling around on the floor, <laughs> and, you know, whatever else. You know, having these, these remember this, there was this thing where you just start laughing, this laughing craze that was taking off. Everyone would just start hooping and hollering. You've seen these things where they're just, you know, they're just gyrating and flopping around and moving around. The speaking in tongues, all this gibberish. You know, and let me just go off on that for a minute. It's usually a woman that does it. I mean, I went to a Pentecostal church for a little while and, you know, the Bible's very clear in 1 Corinthians, I believe, chapter 11, where it says that let the women keep silence in the church. You know, if you don't like that, take it up with God. But I thought it was kind of strange that it was always a woman that did the prophesying. Who else has ever noticed that in these Pentecostal churches? It's always a woman that's doing it. She's like, here's my chance, right? You know, 
I've always wanted to pipe up in church, you know, and, and if they all think if I get filled with the Spirit, I can say whatever I want, right? So I'm like, blah, 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 blah. you know, and then, the, then some man would stand up and be like, uh, the Lord saith to the body, you know, or whatever, and try to interpret it. I was like, this is a big joke. But that's what people think being filled with the Spirit is today. You know, but that's not being filled with the Spirit. You know, being filled with the Spirit is having the fruits of the Spirit. You know, peace, love, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, all these things. Those, that's the fruit of the Spirit in our life. You know, that's how you can tell if you're filled with the Spirit. But being filled with the Spirit is not you going through some strange, you know, Pentecostal type whatever, you know, possession. It's in a lot of cases, is probably what it is. But being filled with the Spirit, what's going on here in the story? You know, he's meeting with God. Right? He's being anointed. He's getting, you know, he's like, like a person gets saved. He's anointed with the oil. He's meeting with God in the way. He's meeting these three men. He's getting the bread from their hands. He's got the word of God. He's eating it. That's, what's, that's his nourishment. And then, you know, then what else comes into play here? The music, right? He meets them. They have the harp and everything. These are the things that are going to help us be filled with the Spirit. You know, letting the word of God dwell rich, richly in you with all wisdom. And, uh, you know, having the, having the word. But also, you know, again, having the music, having the song there. As it says in verse 5, it says, A company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them. You know, music is a, is a very powerful thing. And people really seriously underestimate the power of music today. You know, and the devil doesn't, right? And the devil takes advantage of it. And if we recall, you know, the devil, uh, you know, he, he w is a very, mu I don't have it in my notes here. I'm trying to recall what it is in Isaiah, but... He, you know, he had tabrets in his body. He was, you know, had all organs. Like he was a, a musical creature. You know, he was kind of like God's, you know, God's song leader, whatever you want to call it, right? right? Before he fell as Lucifer, and he was very beautiful. But he knows the power of music. And people today, they, they seriously underestimate it. They treat music like some kind of filler, like you would find in a Twinkie or something. They just want to make it some just kind of cheap, flavorful thing that's just going to help me get through my day. They always have to have music in the background. It's everywhere you go. It's in every grocery store. It's in every, you know, well, I don't know if it's in banks. Gas stations have it. You can't even pump gas today without some screen popping on in, in some plane. Or you go into some restaurant to get some food like I did today, and you have to just listen to the most ungodly music. And it's not even, you know, you don't even own the album, right? You don't even, you've never even bought it and sat down and listened to it on purpose. But you've just been out in the world or in work, and you've heard it so many times that you know the words. You weren't even trying to listen. You're like, oh, I know the next verse. It's wicked. You know, and, and, that, and at w the workplace is like the worst. You know, that's, that's one thing I could never stand. You know, when you get in a truck full of dudes on the, on the job site or something, they just want to put on the classic rock or the, the, you know, the morning talk shows. and all the, the, That's a whole other subject, right? But look, the devil knows the power of music, and man seriously underestimates it. And what do we see here when that Saul is going to be among the prophets all these things take place, and one big part of it is the song. Are you still there in Colossians 3? Go back to Colossians 3 if you're not there. I'll read to you from Ephesians 5. It says, Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with, the wine, uh, with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, that's a command. It's God's command for His children to be filled with the Spirit. You know, we should endeavor as Christians to be like Saul, to be filled with the Spirit. You know, we should ask ourselves tonight, are we filled with the Spirit? You know, it, because it's, we're commanded to be so. He said, be filled with the Spirit. And, how, and then he goes on to verse 19 and says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. And that's in Ephesians 5. Look, that's no coincidence that he says, be filled with the Spirit, semicolon, and then says, you know, speaking to yourselves in hymns. I, I, excuse me, in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart. One of the best ways for a person to get filled with the Spirit is to sing. Not just listen to music, but actually sing it. And you say, well, I'm not a very good singer. Well, then sing alone. Sing, as it says there, right? Uh, speaking to yourselves in psalms, right? <laughs> you can do that silently, or not silently, but you, know, you could do it to yourself, you know, in the car or wherever. Uh, you know, but I think that's a big part. It, and I'm telling you, it'll change your attitude. It's one of those things, you could be having a bad day, and if you just say, you know what, I'm just going to sing a hymn. I'm just going to break out Psalm 67 and start singing, or whatever song you like, whatever, get the hymnal out and just sing it. You know, it will really change your attitude. It will change your outlook. And, and you could tell when somebody's filled with the Spirit because, you, you know, 
And I'm not saying if nobody ever sings that they're not filled with the Spirit, okay? But I'm saying when I see people that are just kind of get caught up and just kind of singing, just kind of on the spur of the moment, I say, that guy's filled with the Spirit in all likelihood. Because he's, he's got it in his head. He's thinking about these things. That's the filling of the Spirit. And if you want to get filled with the Spirit like the Bible commands, a good way to do it is through the hymns, through singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord. I mean, doesn't the, look, the world likes to get filled with their spirit, don't they? How do they do it? With music. They like to get all filled up with whatever spirit is they're filled with, the spirit of the world, the spirit of the flesh. They like to get in it and, and, you know, and, and, get, and get excited about that when they go to the rock concerts and the, and the rap concerts or whatever, and their country music, whatever it is, whatever genre. You know, they, that's how they pump themselves up and get into what they're into is through music because it's powerful. The Bible says where you are in Colossians 3, look at verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. So what do we have? Again, it's these two elements, just like we saw in Saul, in Saul's story here, in 1 first, in, uh, first Samuel 10. You have the word of God, right? You have the bread there. And he's saying, look, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, right? Then you also have psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You have the men coming down from, from the high place, the mount, with the tabrets and the pipes and the harps and so on and so forth. So that's how Saul ended up, you know, being filled with the Spirit. That's how the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And I believe that's a good, you know, recipe for us to look at the story and, and look at these elements that are here and say, look, if I want to be among the prophets... Whether it's behind a pulpit, you know, or like I've said, I'll, you know, because it's a, because I preach this and I don't want anyone to think, oh, this is just for men and more specifically men that want to be preachers someday. No, this is for everybody. Amen. Anybody that's ever going to do any type of preaching. I mean, we all have people we want to preach to in our life. At least we should. We have lost, saved, uh, unlocked, excuse me, we have lost loved ones that we want to see get saved. You know, we might be the only ones that can preach to them. Are we going to preach to them in the fullness of the spirit? Or are we just kind of going to go through the motions and say, well, I did my duty? Are we going to do it with you know, a burden, with a tear in the eye, and really mean it, filled with the Spirit? You say, well, I want to do it that way. I want to do it. I want to have the power. I want to have the unction of the Holy Ghost upon me. I want to do it in this power of God when I preach to somebody that I care about and know and love. Well, then maybe you need to look at the story tonight and go, look, do, you know, I've got, great, I'm glad I'm anointed. I'm glad I'm, you know, that which is lost has been found. But have I met with God lately? You know, have I spent time talking to Him and praying to Him about this? You know, do I have the two loaves? Am I getting my Bible reading it? You know, and, and, and am, I, am I being filled with the Spirit by singing and making melody in my heart? You know, this is the, the recipe. And it's not, you know, again, it's not you, you're not just going to, and that, that's what makes the, this, it's just such a cheap thing to say, oh, being filled with the Spirit is just flopping around like a dead fish out of water or whatever, and, and blah, 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 making a bunch of noise. It makes it real cheap. Yeah. But look, the, the filling of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit is a very real thing and it's something we all have to have. Not just the guy behind the pulpit. And not just, you know, anybody. Every man, woman, boy, and girl who wants to preach the gospel with power needs to have the Holy Spirit. <coughs> now let's move on with the story here. Uh, We've got to wrap it up here for sake of time. But he says, uh, the story goes on. It says in verse 11, It came to pass, when all knew him uh, before time saw that before... Oh, let me... Let me pick, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm jumping over a bunch of verses. Let's go back to verse 7. It says, uh, verse 6, And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon me, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. Mm. Now, obviously, he's not changing his identity or anything like that. But he's just, it's just a, I believe that's just kind of a euphemism for him just saying, look, it's, you're going to be like a whole new person. You know, and that's really something that will happen in our life, too. You know, if we're filled with the Spirit, people are going to notice. And that's exactly what happens in the story. When you get filled with the Spirit, they're going to say, you're like a different person. Well, yeah, it's because, you know, you used to know the old man. You know, I'm a new creature in Christ. All things are, are made new. Amen. You know, that it's the new man's coming out when, with the Spirit, you know. But he says here, uh, thou shalt become another man, and let it be when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion, God, as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee and show thee what thou shalt do. And it was so that when he had turned his back uh, to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart and all those signs came to pass. And when, uh, and when they came thither to the hill, behold, a company of prophets met him 
and the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied among them. So all these things take place. You know, he gets the bread, and he prophesies among them. And it says in verse uh, 13, And when he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high... Uh, I'm jumping ahead. Verse 11. And it came to pass, when all that knew him before time saw that, behold, he prophesied among the prophets, then the people said one to another, What is this that has come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? You know, he gets filled with the Spirit. You know, he's actually living for God. And everybody that knew him before time is saying, well, you changed. Boy, you're sure different. You know, why don't you run to the same, same excess of riot that you used to? You know, why, what's all this God talk? What do you mean the Bible? You know, and you say, something's changed about you. And I remember when I first got saved and got serious about getting in church, I, I'll never forget it. Uh, I had a family member say, you know, the, the, the you of today would laugh, or the you of yesterday, the you of a year ago would laugh at the you of today. He'd make fun of, like, the, the old, they, they called me CJ growing up. They said, you know, the CJ we used to know, we'd be making fun of this CJ. And I said, I know, but you know what? I changed. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> you know, this is what I'm about now. You know, I'm about the bread. You know, I'm about the word of God. I'm about the prophesying. I'm about preaching. I'm about these things. This is, this is it. This is the new me. Yeah. You better get used to it. <coughs> so he said, uh, he said, what is this that has come unto the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And one of the same answered and said, but who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb, is Saul also among the prophets? Now, every time I read that, you say it became a proverb. You see that in scripture from time to time. And they have these sayings. I always try to think about what, in what context would they use that? Because it kind of became like a saying, you know, we would, like we have today, we have different proverbs that we use and stuff like that. I can't think of any right now, but I, I know that we have them, right? But this is kind of something that they would use back then. And they say, well, Saul among the prophets. You know, and the way I was, I was thinking about this, like, well, what did they mean by that? What, what, what would they use? It? Well, you look at the context, it's, you know, they're saying, who, look, we know who this guy is. Look, who's his dad? Is he among the prophets? Like, they're saying, boy, this sure is strange. This sure is different. No one expected this. So I think probably the way they used this in a proverb back then, you know, whenever something unexpected happened and somebody's kind of shocked by it, like, I can't believe this. Is this really happening? They'd say, well, Saul among the prophets. You know, that's how I met. I'm probably wrong about that. And if you got an idea, I don't know. But whenever I read about these proverbs being used that way, I always try to figure out what way they would use them. It really had, that's probably not going to edify anybody, but I threw it out there anyway. <laughs> but it says in verse 13, And we had made an end of prophesying, and came to the high place. And Saul's uncle said unto, hi, uh, uh, unto him and to his servant, Whither went ye? And he said, To seek the asses. And we saw that they were, uh, they were nowhere. We came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. And Saul told his uncle, how he, told, he told us plainly that the asses were found, but the matter of the kingdom whereof Samuel spake, uh, he told him not. And again, I believe you know, that this is just showing us Saul's humility once again. And that's something you have to keep in mind because the beginning, you know, the, a big part of 1 Samuel is about the story of Saul. You know, I know it says 1 Samuel, but it's about Saul. Of course, Samuel plays a big part in that in his life. But you have, you know, we're going to read some things about Saul later in the story that are not going to be very good at all. You know, Saul ends his life very badly, but it's worth pointing out here just the amount of humility this man started out with. And that's really the lesson that er all of us should take from Saul. And I know I've already preached this, is that it's one thing to start out humble, but it's another thing to stay humble. And that was his big downfall. And here, I him, him saying, oh, what, you know, coming to his uncle and saying, you know, tell me everything Samuel said. Well, he told him, <laughs> he said, I'm going to be king, you know. So why don't you just bow down? You know, <laughs> he didn't just come in all haughty and everything. He he tried to hide it. He's like he he didn't even mention it. Didn't even bring it up. You know, I don't think at this point he's doubting that that's going to happen. You know, after everything that just happened, I mean, he's prophesying. He's becoming another man. All these signs are coming to pass. Like he's probably pretty sure of himself. Like it says, you know, God gave him another heart. Like he came around in his thinking. He understood this is going to happen. But he's not being, you know, he's not being loud and proud about it. He's not just, you know, throwing it in everybody's face. You know, he's keeping it to himself. You say, well, maybe that's because he's afraid. Or maybe, you know, what I think it is, is that he's just a humble guy. That's how he started out. And it says in verse 17, And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mizpeh, and said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I have brought uh, up Israel out of Egypt and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and of all the hands of all the kingdoms of them that oppressed you. And ye this day have rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversities and your tribulations. And ye have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. 
And when Samuel was, had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. And when he, the, and when he had caused the tribes of Benjamin to come near, by their families, the family of uh, Matri was taken. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. And again, this is you know, more of his humility, or maybe he really is just genuinely scared. But this always kind of gets a chuckle out of me whenever I read of it. He says, Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if, if, if the man should yet come thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. I mean, and you've got to remember, we already know that Saul's this big guy, right? Because it says when they brought him forth, you know, that he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. That's what it says in verse 23. So it's just this really big dude trying to hide in stuff. <laughs> I mean, you ever, now I can have a little bit of experience with this, like playing hide and seek with my kids, <laughs> you know? And when you get to be about my size, like a full grown adult, that gets really challenging. You know, when you're just a little kid, you can go hide in little cupboards and stuff like that. You know, I remember as a kid thinking, this is a lot of fun, but now I'm more the seeker than the, than the, than the, than the sot. You know, I'm not the hider these days. You know, I'm, I remember one time trying to hide under the bunk bed, you know, and it's got like that much clearance. And I come in like the bunk bed's like <laughs> <laughs> kind of moving back and forth. I mean, there's like a leg sticking out. And they're like, Dad, what are you doing? You know, there's very few places, if any, that I can hide in my house, so... That, and whenever I read this, I just get a chuckle out of it because it's this big guy, you know, who you think would be just full of confidence, ready to take the kingdom, ready to do God's will, and he's just cowering somewhere. And God has to tell him, look, he's behind the stuff. Go find him. And, they, and then it says they fetched him, right? They, they actually had to go there. You know, it's like when you're getting caught playing hide and seek. Like, you know you're caught, but you still keep hiding. <laughs> like, that's kind of what's going on. They're like, Saul, you know, and then they have to actually drag him out. I imagine just having to pull him. He's like getting shoved up there, and they're like, Here's your king. And he's just really awkward. It's a funny story, you know, but it also shows us that, you know, Saul started out a humble man. You know, not somebody who was just looking for the position, absolutely had to have it, you know, wouldn't be satisfied unless he was the only one that was going to be rule over Israel. He was very reluctant to take it, and, and he had to be kind of pushed into that position. And it says in verse 24, And Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen, that there is none like him among all the people? And of course, you know, this is kind of a bigger story, but they're going to learn a very important lesson about that, that God does not look on the outward appearance, but he looketh upon the heart. And what impresses man does not impress God. And when you're looking for somebody to be a leader, you know, it's not the exterior that matters. It's, it's what's within that person. And it says, uh, and, and all the people shouted and said, God save the king. And then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah. And there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. And, you know, I really wish I'd had more time to develop these last couple of verses because these are great verses. And he says, but the children of Belial said, how shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him uh, no presence, but held his peace. So really just in closing real quick, what I will say about those last couple of verses is that, you know, uh, people who are disloyal or unloyal, you know, a lot of times, you know, they're not good people, okay? And people who are loyal, they're loyal for the right reasons because God has touched their heart. You know, and sometimes we have to go through things and, and God touches our heart. But, you know, when you, when you have a man of God, when you have a leader, you know, and he's preached things and taught you things, that should touch your heart. You know, when, 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 when somebody's investing themselves, you know, in, in studying the Word of God and preaching the Word of God, and trying to edify the body through the preaching of the Word of God, that really should touch our heart. Amen. And that should make us loyal people. Amen. Meaning that we'll follow that man, right? We'll, we're willing to follow him. And that, I mean, that's what it says there. It says, uh, they're all, they, uh, and Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose heart God had touched. You know, they were moved by God to follow this man. But the children of B, how shall man, this man save us? And it says, and they despised him. You know, wicked people tend to despise the man of God. So let that be a lesson. You know, when you see people, when you see a man of God, and he has people who are following him, whose hearts have been moved, but then you see another group of people who are despising him, you know, that's actually usually a good sign that you've got a real man of God there, that you've got a real leader, that somebody who really is anointed, really is filled with the Spirit, and really is, you know, been called to that position to, to do that work. And I love Saul's reaction here. Right, more of his humility, but he held his peace. He didn't say, don't you know who I am? Didn't you hear what Samuel said? He held his peace. And look, a lot of times that's the best way to handle a child of the devil. These, be the, you know, these Baalites, these, Belial, these, these children of Belial, is to just hold your peace. 
Because a lot of times what you end up doing is just casting your pearls before swine. Right. And they turn again and rend you. Like we read, uh, where was it? I was preaching earlier, you know, the man, the, the David's last words when he was ripping on <laughs> the sons of Belial and, when his, and his dying breath. The man that toucheth them must be fenced with iron and use a spear and they must thrust them away to be burned. Right? He's saying, look, you know, but sometimes it's better to just hold your peace just to lay off and just, you know, God will avenge. You know, and, th and that's a really a whole other sermon right there is that why is he holding his peace? Because God avenges. And that's one of the great things about being one of God's children is that when you come across these sons of Belial, when you come people who despise you know, those that are good and may even do you evil, maybe even do you hurt, you don't, have to, you don't have to exact vengeance on them. You can hold your peace and God will do it for you. In fact, that's what God says. He says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Thus say it the Lord. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of great lessons in this chapter. You know, that was kind of a, a little mini sermon right there real quick. But the primary application tonight is what? Is that if you want to be a spirit-filled preacher, you got to have some things. You know, what, and, and not just the guy behind the pulpit. I'm talking about everybody. you got to have the, sp the filling of the Spirit of God. And how do you get that? Meeting with God, getting in the Word of God, you know, getting in the, the songs and the hymns, you know, and we should want that. You know, in fact, we're commanded in Scripture in the New Testament to be filled with the Spirit. So let's do